All right, module seven, the last module. Lesson 7.1, drive friction. Lesson 7.1 objectives. We're going to be able to draw a free body diagram that includes the effect of friction and then solve problems involving friction. So all we're doing is the same stuff we've done before. We're just adding friction into the mix. Some applications. You know, oftentimes we've been neglecting it. You, you, we often do neglect it in professional engineering when we can. Uh, sometimes we can't. Sometimes we don't want to, right? Like this disc brake here, it wants friction to happen. It relies on friction to work. How can we calculate the magnitude and direction of the friction force when we need to or want to consider it? So say we have a box of weight W, and we're just going to have the weight being centered in the middle. It's just a uniform density box for this problem. It can be different and and you can have all different types of problems. We're just going to look at this one, saying that it's uniform weight. So it's got a weight right in the middle, acting down, it's sitting on the ground here. Okay, And if it's sitting on the ground and it's at rest, that means static equilibrium, which means it's not accelerating, which means something must be happening to counterbalance this, right? You know what it is. It's that upward force, equal and opposite. And it's, and it's perpendicular to the ground in this instance, so that's the normal force. Now, if we add a small force P pushing to the right, so let's just say we're going to grab, you know, way down at the very bottom just for, for, for the first part of this conversation and say we're going to push this box to the right from the very bottom with some small force P, some starting off very small. If it's very small, do you think the box would still be in a static equilibrium? Yes, probably, because we have to overcome friction first. So a friction force is generated that resists that force P with an equal and opposite force. The friction force pushes back just enough to balance the applied force P so that it doesn't move. So now the box satisfies some of forces in the X and some of forces in the Y. However, what if we keep pushing with more and more force P? At some point, the friction force is going to reach its limit. The maximum value is mu times the force normal, which you've probably heard many times in physics. Mu is that coefficient of friction. If the box is at rest, then it's the coefficient of static friction. If it's moving, you have the coefficient of kinetic friction. And that's based on how the two surfaces, meaning the bottom of the box and the top of the ground surface, how they interlock at the granular level, like, like saw teeth, you know, grinding against each other, fitting into grooves like puzzles. The more uneven the surfaces, the more the interlock, the higher the mu. When the two surfaces are at rest, that box has, a, has the opportunity to like settle down into the grooves more, and it locks in more. And that's why the coefficient of static friction is high higher than the coefficient of kinetic friction. That's why it's harder to get a box started moving than to keep it moving. The coefficient of static friction is usually greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. There is a point right as the friction force reaches its max that we will call impending motion. We often look at this case to see what our limiting condition is if we don't want the object to move. At this point, the force is equal to the maximum friction force, which is mu s times n, and any more increase in our applied force p will cause motion. We're taking statics. If we don't want it to accelerate, then we don't want it to start moving. A lot of times, we're going to look at these problems as what force would cause motion to occur, and that's what we mean by impending motion. It means, you know, if you push with that force... P, that's equal to F max, which is mu S times N. If you push just one, you know, tenth of a pound more, that box is going to start budging. Just a tenth of a pound less, according to the numbers anyway, the box doesn't budge. So it's right at the, at the, at the sliding point, right at the point of impending motion. So we're going to be solving for that a lot. All right, now let's keep going with our analysis here. We got this box, again, with a mass. It's got, uh, causes a weight. W there right in the middle. Okay, we got our normal force. And we have that force P pushing against it. Okay, but what if we um, 
want to find out how large that force P needs to be to cause the box to slide. Like I said before, we were going to look at that force being equal to mu S times N. So if we have P equal to F max, then we know that it's right at impending motion. So what happens if we push with just a little bit more? Like I said, that's when we start to get the movement. Okay. Now, what happens if we start to move the force higher up the box? Okay. I'm sure, actually, you might think about this the other way. If you're pushing like a big crater or a refrigerator or something and you push too high, it might start tipping over. And what do you do? You, you crouch down lower and you push lower so it doesn't tip over. We're going to get into that in very big detail right here. Okay. And how we're going to do that is thinking about the moments involved. Okay, so as we raise the force P up to some height H, so here we have P moved up to some height H above the ground. We still have that force of friction acting along the surface where it has to. The weight of the box is still pointing straight down like it has to. So to resist the moment that wants to occur, this overturning moment, this toppling moment, the force normal actually shifts, in this case, to the right. So the, re the normal force, the, the ground's resisting force will shift over. And it will move over by some amount A, such that N times A will be a counterclockwise moment that is equal and opposite to P times H, right? So if you have a force P that you know that value and you're pushing at some height H and you know that value, you would know the weight, so you know the value N. You could solve for A, right? It could be P times H over N, and that would give you what A is by doing a sum of moments equation, this one that we have here. And A would be a finite number, right? Very finite, because if it gets bigger than B over 2 in this case, what that means is that the force that, or the moment that, that the P is applying, that overturning moment, will exceed the box's ability to keep itself upright. And it will tip over. All right, so if you can, so if we, if we calculated what, if we said, okay, well, let's just set A equal to B over two, and we know this force in because of it's equal and opposite to the weight. So we, we can put that there. We know the moment that this box is capable of, of resisting overturning with. So then, if we know the force we're pushing with here with P, we know the maximum height that we can have that force P acting at and not cause it to tip over. So this is also like an impending motion problem. It's just an impending tipping problem. So, in summary, we've kind of talked about two different ways that this box could start moving. One, it, it could slide across the floor. If you're trying to move the box, that's the one you want. Tipping it over is the other one where you, you're pushing your force P high enough that it's wanting to topple over and rotate about this front corner. Okay. To check sliding, we put we, we check to see if our force P is greater than or equal to our maximum friction force of mu S times N. To check for tipping, we check for the force P that would be required to cause that moment to occur. And such that A is maximum, where A is B over 2. So this is N times A over H would give us P, right? We can check P against P. Um, applied P versus maximum allowed P before tipping, where A, you know, N A over H is N times B over 2, the maximum value of A divided by H. And then you're going to get two different P's, and they're like, you know, what ifs? They're like, well, you know, what if we push... Uh, what if we want it to, to slide? This is the force P that's required to cause sliding. What if it's going to tip? This is the force P that would be required for it to tip. The smaller one is the one that's going to be reached first as somebody starts pushing, and that's going to be the failure that occurs or the motion that occurs. Here's some problem-solving strategies for working with dry friction. And these are more strategies. It's not really a step-by-step -step because we're just throwing... The whole point of this lesson is to throw friction into the mix of every other thing that you've been doing. So you can draw free bodies of, of frames and machines. You might have friction involved now, right? So, of course, what you're going to do is draw a free body diagram. 
And then on your diagram, you're going to find where the friction forces are developing, right? And you're going to put them on there, label them. And here's the thing. We were just talking about impending motion, saying that the, the maximum friction force is mu s times n. But that's only at impending motion. If you're looking at a statics problem, you know, um, like we're going to look at a ladder leaning against a wall later and, and, and see... Um, you know, does it slip or not? Well, so in that case, it's not at impending motion. You're going to check the state and see if it does have motion. Uh, so it might be well below. So you have to solve the statics where the force F, the frictional force, is really just equal and opposite to the forces that are wanting to cause motion. Because the friction force really, its nature is it always wants to resist motion with an equal and opposite force applied until it can't do it anymore and then motion occurs. So once you have all that, you just solve the problem as usual. You're going to have just kind of new unknowns with a little bit more definition to them. Like A lot of times the friction force is kind of like a reaction, right? Uh, you just know that it has a maximum value before it will start to slip or something. 